topic of this panel is the impact on North American energy security and, and independence, operational achievements, and capital requirements. And uh, uh, to, to address these questions, we have representatives uh, from both industry and government. We have uh, several topics we want to get into, subtopics, uh, and we're going to lead with a discussion of, of oil exports because it's so central. We're then going to talk a little bit about uh, infrastructure, and, uh, and we'll get into uh, a number of other details thereafter. So with that, uh, let, let us uh, go ahead and sit down, and I'll sit down, and we'll talk from there. I'm going to ask uh, Doug Suttles uh, to lead off because Doug and Al Walker, as representatives of uh, two of the uh, most dynamic independents we have uh, exploiting uh, these unconventional resources, have uh, been working on that issue of, of oil exports. This, in my view, is one of the most important policy issues uh, that uh, can be addressed by our Congress and our administration. Um, between now and, and the end of this, uh, of this president's term. Uh, because in the absence of, of making, coming up with a workable solution to a ban that was put in place uh, four decades ago, uh, we will have consequences that I think are unfortunate. You'll hear about some of that. Uh, but given that uh, Doug and Al spent time in our nation's capital uh, earlier this week, uh, I want to turn it over to them to talk about this to open it, and then we'll move on to some of the infrastructure and uh, strategy and cap capital allocation questions. Doug? Yeah, thanks, Tom. And um, Al and I spent uh, the best parts of, of uh, Thursday and uh, or Wednesday and Thursday of last week in Washington talking to members of the Senate and the White House about this very issue. And I, I guess just to recap, um, there was a group of 21 independent uh, North American producers got together uh, a few months ago. Uh, we call ourselves PACE, which is producers um, for, for basically allowing us to, to export crude, to, to basically engage, educate, and advocate on this topic. And, and as you said, the, the ban was put in place in 1975 in a time of energy scarcity. Some people in this room like me are probably old enough to remember the, the gasoline lines that existed then. And of course, today we're in an era of energy abundance. I mean, it's, it's an incredible renaissance that's happened. We've seen U.S. crude production go up from 5 million barrels a day to 9 million barrels a day in a very short period of time, the application of technology making a huge impact. And when we look at what's happening today, so many people talk about WTI, or West Texas Intermediate, which is fundamentally the domestic price of, of oil. Uh, here in North America, here in the United States, and then they refer to Brent, which is usually referred to as the world price of oil. And today, those two crudes trade at about a $10 difference. Um, and that $10 difference, it's $10 lower in the United States than in the world. And the reason for that is, is that for, for the last couple of decades, we were reducing the amount of light, of light oil we produced in the United States, and the refineries in this country reconfigured to run heavy oils. Heavy oils brought in from Canada, from Venezuela, from Mexico, and other places. Um, so even though we don't produce enough oil to meet all of our current needs, we produce the wrong type of oil to ma manage with our refineries. So we've constrained the system. And in fact, as we sit here today, um, you may have noticed that oil prices in the United States are falling rapidly. It's because storage is filling up. We're almost full. We're at record levels today just because the refineries can't, can't take that crude. And in fact, it's a seasonal event this year, but if we don't do something quickly, it'll quickly become a full-time event probably by 2017. So by lifting this ban, it may not be intuitive, but what it does is it allows, it will actually mean gasoline prices go down. And the reason for that is uh, we can export refined products, gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, all of the products made from crude are allowed to be exported. So therefore, the price of gasoline is not set by the price of domestic oil, it's set by the international price of oil. And some of you may have actually noticed this. Um, over the, uh, the past few weeks, the price of oil here in the United States has been holding in the high 40s, where the price of Brent, or, or the international price, went up about $10 to 60. And gasoline prices went up about 40 cents a gallon, which is a, a, a real proof point of how gasoline is priced in this country. Um, I, when we went to Washington, it was surprising. The reception was quite good. The education level is growing. 
And not only do people understand the economic argument, even though they're worried about the politics of the argument, they understand the economics. They also understand the impact to jobs in this country, to tax revenues in this country. Um, but also a piece that, that seemed to connect quite closely to them was the geopolitical piece. And, and when you're in Washington, D.C., and you run an oil and gas company, you, you feel like you're on thin ice talking about geopolitics, even though it has a huge impact on our business all the time. Um, when, we, when we talked about this, and wouldn't the world be a better place, a safer place potentially, if we could export our crude to countries today who have to buy crude from places like Russia and Iran? Um, and, and so I think that the reception was strong, the arguments in there, it's, it, it, it's interesting, it's pro-consumer, it's pro the economy, it's pro national security, um, and I think there's the understanding is growing quickly, and it's a bipartisan issue. I think that was the other thing that was noticed while we were there. Yeah, I, I will add a lot to what Doug just mentioned because I think he covered it quite well. But I think for a lot of people, just understanding kind of how we got here is helpful, and most people, uh, particularly folks that uh, don't really follow our industry closely. Uh, don't appreciate that uh, six years ago, the price of oil in the United States in 2009 was roughly what it is today. Uh, in 2009, as a country, we produced around 5 million barrels of oil. And as of last week, we produced 9.4 million barrels of oil and likely to crest somewhere towards 10 million, as you heard this morning, uh, from our folks uh, from ExxonMobil, who probably in this industry uh, know more about what goes on in our business than the rest of us combined. But nonetheless, we'll probably crest at around 10 million barrels a day or pretty close to it. And that is what has caused this disconnect between our domestic uh, price for crude oil and the international price for crude oil. While the consumer pays more for uh, prices at the pump, and as Doug's pointed out many times when I've been with him with various senators or with the White House, uh, if you just think about that $10 delta that he made reference to, that not all of that flows to us as producers. Frankly, upwards to a half of that will go to local municipalities, uh, states through the form of taxes, uh, and they also then go to the royalty owners that uh, produce that because it's a revenue tax, not an income tax. So actually we're taking money out of the school systems, we're taking money out of the municipalities where we produce, simply because we're using a ban that was put in place in the 70s when the world was very different than it is today, and our supply picture is, uh, as a country is very different. Um, I think Doug and I saw, along with a few of our colleagues, uh, both from uh, the Republican side of the aisle as well as the Democrat side of the aisle as well as with the administration, a, a very good understanding of exactly why we're where we are and why we need to think collectively in a way that will somehow reduce what's happening today on the consumer, uh, what actually will occur with a higher tax rate. Uh, and a better situation for the communities and where we produce oil. And then also around the, uh, the, just the investment. So there's a lot of independent research not done, not stuff that's funded by the oil and gas business, uh, whether it's the Brookings Institute, a study out of Columbia, uh, IHS, all point to the fact that this actually not only is good for the consumer uh, at the gasoline pump or at the refined products level, but frankly, it will, according to IHS, encourage up to $1 trillion of investment that without the uh, repeal of the ban wouldn't occur. And that is a broad-based increase in jobs, not just in the oil and gas sector, but in all areas of our economy. So to Tom's earlier point, it's the Tom's now, the Tom's real. And uh, Doug and I, along with a few of our colleagues, will continue to press this issue because I am surprised as I sit here today, given where we are, I wouldn't have thought a year ago we would have had this kind of traction. Yeah, I agree with that. And I want to leave this for, for questions later because there are a number of other topics we want to cover. But, but do write down questions if you have them, and we'll try to get to those a little later in the session. What I'd like to do now is move on to, and it will come back to the question of oil pricing in general when we talk about capital allocation um, in the upstream. But I'd like to ask Russ and Drew uh, to speak to uh, some of the infrastructure build out that they're looking at, uh, TransCanada looking at it. Uh, interestingly, very much on the theme here, involved with Canada, the US, and Mexico, and then also to have a Canadian government policy perspective from Drew uh, as to what we're dealing with in this, at this time. Well, thanks, Tom, and um, I guess maybe to, to, to just dovetail to what, uh, what both Al and, and Doug have talked about. You know, you know, 
the, the renaissance in, in energy production in North America is, is driving a world that we couldn't see even five years ago. Um, the, the world is going to change, change substantially. Um, uh, on the one hand, as, as I mentioned, you know, oil production in the US is up by five million barrels a day. Um, oil production in Canada is up by about a million barrels a day. Uh, in a world in North America where we consume about 15 million barrels a day, um, we're very closely approaching a place where we don't need offshore barrels anymore. You combine that with you know, the, the, the explosion in natural gas production, moving from a place where we were five years ago to today where you know, five years ago we were looking at, at LNG imports. The price of gas was $13 or $14. You know, gas on the water right now is you know, $15, $16. And we are sitting here in North America with enough natural gas to supply us the next 200 years at somewhere between $3 and $6 in MCF. Um, the world has changed uh, upside down. That is a great opportunity for us. It's not shared by many, many countries around the world. I think as Rob Gardner showed you this morning, um, you look at places like Asia, their demand for energy is growing. They don't have access to this energy supply. So if you're Japan, you import 98% of your energy needs. You layer on top of that a Fukushima um, and in a public backlash against nuclear generation, and you need to supply electricity to your people. How are you going to do it? You can't frack in, in, uh, in Japan. You need to import LNG. It's a serious, serious matter for them. Korea, the same, same kind of situation. So we in North America have this first opportunity to supply ourselves. Um, that's going to have huge impacts on the environment. It already has. The explosion of, 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 uh, of natural gas production is displacing coal without regulation. The economics are, are dictating you know, uh, high, you know, higher utilization of our, of our natural gas fleet. That's brought, brought down CO2 uh, uh, emissions. And at the same time, positions us um, to be a supplier to the world, and you think of the geopolitical implications that, uh, that the Secretary talked about last night, uh, our world is going to change. But in order to make that happen, you have to actually build the infrastructure to get that production from production source to a market. First of all, in North America, you know, to get efficiently from the wellhead to those refineries, um, to get from the wellhead to um, where we're going to burn natural gas, where we're going to build those new natural gas plants, you need to build infrastructure. Um, and you need to build uh, you know, those, those, those natural gas-fired power plants. Is the, 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 I saw the statistic the other day, Tom, the, you know, the IEA forecast, in, you know, it's sort of in tandem with you know, the Exxon forecast this morning, where the world's going to need all of these energy sources, that we're going to need to be able to spend about $40 trillion across North America in that same, same time frame on the infrastructure alone. And probably a surprise to most people here is, is the biggest um, uh, chunk of that infrastructure is going to be cost is going to be spent right here in North America. Everybody would think that it would be Asia. It's actually going to be here in North America as we change out the coal fleet, as we move to renewables, as we you know, bring on this, this new natural gas supply, build the ports, terminals, liquefaction facilities it's going to take to, to supply the rest of the world. But where we are right now is actually mired in regulation and we're stalled. I mean, the, the Keystone Pipeline is, is the poster boy uh, of it, but that is, that's happening in, in a lot of these other places. So we have to somehow get to a place where we separate these issues of, of, uh, of, of environment um, and infrastructure and, and focus on you know, the real matters as we want to make sure that we can, can safely, efficiently, and in an environmentally responsible way develop the resource and move it from production source to local markets and then to global markets. And if we can do that, we fundamentally change the outlook, I think, for the economy and uh, uh, you know, future prosperity, but as well, um, you know, the global stability. I think it's, it's, it's critically important. Russ, one of the things you've said to me is, is to, to put into perspective the Keystone Pipeline vis-a-vis -vis this uh, infrastructure is how much is that is Keystone a part of your infrastructure build out over the next half decade or so? Yeah, so in, in tandem, this is a good point, Tom, is, is it um, for us, as I look at that $40 trillion of infrastructure that's going to be acquired across North America, you break it down, or across the globe, and then you break it down in North America, there's an opportunity like we've never seen, and you put you know, people to work building those things. Uh, for TransCanada alone, we have about $50 billion of projects that have been approved by our board of directors that are un underpinned by contractual support from, from primarily the producing community, but also uh, customers, uh, both domestically and internationally. Uh, customers we never thought that we'd see before. So in the context, you know, Keystone is $8 billion for us of a $50 billion portfolio. And then on top of that $50 billion portfolio, we've got sort of requests to look at things 
um, that, that it would probably add another 50 billion. And there's more companies that look like us. And as you pointed out, we're, you know, we're on our fifth pipeline in Mexico. We're building out in, in, in the United States. Um, and we're building out in Canada. And that is in all three areas, most people don't know, is we're, we're, we're big in, in the natural gas transportation business. We've got a large power portfolio that includes, we're building solar plants, we're building windmills. Uh, but we're also refurbishing our nuclear facilities, um, uh, refurbishing our gas-fired facilities, refurbishing and, and converting our coal-fired facilities at the same time. So that, that investment is happening across all energy sources, across all three of these countries. And I, it's a pretty exciting time. And uh, uh, again, to the point is we, we really have to get past you know, the, these minor issues on, on uh, you know, squabbling about uh, uh, things that are symbolic and not actually germane to, to actually delivering on the services that we need to deliver. You know, it, it strikes me that some of the arguments about energy security on oil exports maybe help, help us with an eventual revisit uh, on the Keystone Pipeline because that, that argument that's been put forth by the President that uh, this is only benefits uh, Canada and it will only be Canadian oil going into the international market and there's nothing in it, quote, for the U.S., you know, I happen to think there's, there's a couple of flaws in that statement, to say the least. But, uh, but I do think if we have success, as we're thinking we may, um, and in building toward better flexibility on oil exports, it, it brings home that point that, in fact, there's, a lo there's something really great for all of North America in that. And, Drew, would, any thoughts you want to have on that or, or other policy matters uh, would be helpful right now? Well, I think on the question of exports, Canada's, at least for the last 30 years, really approached it from a different perspective. We are an energy exporting nation. Uh, three quarters of our oil production is exported. We couldn't survive as an oil uh, and gas uh, uh, economy or an energy economy without exports. So it's within the Canadian populace, we don't have the same debate that's happening in Washington about whether to export or not. Um, in fact, most of our infrastructure, or a lot of our infrastructure, runs north-south as opposed to east-west, uh, much to the, the, the concern of nationalists around, around the country. But I mean, that's the way the, uh, that uh, the economics have pushed the infrastructure. And thankfully, under NAFTA, it's been a relatively seamless process to get that infrastructure built. Yep. Um, one of the points that my minister constantly makes when he's asked a question about Keystone or any other uh, infrastructure question um, is that there are already 70 oil and gas pipelines that crisscross the Canada-US border. They operate pretty much under the radar. Um, they're not political issues. Uh, Canadians and Americans, when they go to the gas pumps, don't necessarily know or care about whether the gasoline is Canadian or American. Same goes for electricity. We've got over 30 uh, grid connections in various provinces and states that deliver electricity back and forth across the borders on a daily basis without re people really knowing about it. We anticipate that uh, in natural resources, which are not just energy, but largely energy, we're expecting at least $650 billion in uh, investment required in infrastructure over the next decade in Canada. A lot of that's going to be on projects like building up the oil sands or offshore production, but some of it's going to be for export capacity, um, whether it's some of those 20 LNG export terminals that are currently being proposed in Canada on both our east and west coasts, or whether it's pipeline capacity to take uh, oil either north, north or sorry, south or east or west, because um, increasingly, as we've heard about with some of the changing dynamics in supply and demand, um, we can't just rely on a single market to the south anymore. We are looking at projects like Energy East that could take uh, oil to Europe or, or further uh, afield, and projects to the west that could take markets, uh, oil and gas to markets uh, where growth is expected in, in Asia Pacific. I think from a government perspective, in terms of the North American infrastructure question, um, I think it was raised earlier, minister, uh, the Prime Minister of Canada and the two presidents of Mexico and the US met in Toluca last year. Uh, they discussed um, how to make North America the most dynamic region in the world. Energy was a trilateral, at, uh, energy was a trilateral priority at that, uh, at that time. It was identified as an area where we needed to do more. Um, for the first time in seven years, the three energy ministers from the, from the three jurisdictions met in Washington, first meeting of its kind in quite a while. And you won't be surprised to hear that infrastructure was a huge focus of that discussion. Not just physical infrastructure, interestingly enough, but also some of the other forms of infrastructure, whether it be labor force, intellectual property, uh, technologies, innovation, energy efficiency practices, were raised as priority areas that we as the three country bloc need to focus on. And I think at that time we also recognized that 
there is a huge boon um, if we can indeed make uh, North America a global energy powerhouse. Um, there's energy security implications, which we've talked about already, um, but it, it does become an energy advantage, um, both from a security perspective, yes, but also from a productivity and uh, competitiveness angle. The IEA projects that by 2040, North America will continue to have the lowest consumer cost for energy in the world. Um, that has implications well beyond the energy sector. It has implications for consumers, of course, but also manufacturers, transportation sectors. And it becomes, if, as the world moves towards trading blocks, um, and you know, we've thought of North America for a long time as a trading block, of course, but I think merging the trading block with the energy block concept is a relatively new one. I think it's a welcome one, and it's, a, as I said, an area where all three governments are planning to do a lot more in the next little while. Right. We have just a little over 20 minutes left, so if you do have questions, there's a question I see here, if, it could be, uh, if somebody could pick it up and bring it down and, and we gather questions, we'll look to move to that in a moment. While we're doing that, if they could bring up the slides that I had, uh, the first slide, um, and I'm not sure, I don't have a, a, a button here, but uh, if it's possible to uh, trigger that, that might set the stage for a little discussion on, on pricing impact on capital allocation. There you go. There it is. Ah, good. This, this chart is a nominal price chart, and it'll be available to you later, so you can see it uh, maybe better than, than from a distance. But uh, from, from the early 70s, uh, when I started my career to the, up to the present, and uh, there have actually been six major declines, and I decided to highlight the four that I think are most important in terms of price collapses for oil uh, that has really trained up the North American industry to deal with this. Um, and there are real lessons learned in each case, and I'm not going to try to go through all that now. But against that backdrop, uh, quite clearly there's, there was the concern that uh, uh, with the OPEC meeting on November 27th, we were setting a different stage. Thank you, Carl. And uh, if we can go to the second, second chart, uh, this picks up on that and just shows what we've been expecting, what we've had recently in terms of the improvement in oil, a dramatic turn up that you know, was beyond anybody's conception earlier. And then if you could hit that button again, we'll bring up the, uh, there, the question marks. I put, I put two dotted lines here to try to bracket some of the possible outcomes that may occur as a result of the pricing change, predicated on a hypothesis, not a prediction, that um, we, we know there's been, with rig laydowns and so on, there has been an impact, and we may be clipping off some of that future growth that has been in the cards, depending on when, the, when we resolve the, uh, the supply-demand imbalance that we're currently dealing with. Um, and the real issue becomes, how does our industry deal with it? We've got two companies in the form of Encana and Anadarko here uh, in the upstream with a big exposure. And I want to give uh, each a chance, ask Al first and then Doug to speak to their thinking about how the shape of the curve may be affected, how their capital allocation strategies are evolving, because this is a big event. As you saw in that first decline, the parallel nature of the decline we've just been experiencing since last fall uh, is eerily close to what we had in 08, 09, for very different reasons. There, the first one, we were worried about a global financial meltdown. The second one, we were uh, really dealing with uh, a, a, uh, an induced uh, slowdown uh, because of the issue of uh, disagreement within OPEC and, the, and Russia over what role they might play in rebalancing things. And how that's going to play out remains to be, we could spend the rest of the day on that. We won't do that. But I do want us to get into capital allocation strategies with Al having a few minutes and then Doug, and then we'll go to the Q&A. Well, uh, I think probably what's not well known is 10 years ago, when we were drilling unconventional resources in the US and Canada, um, it was not a real big part of our activity. Frankly, industry drilled what was referred to and still is conventional resources. So when we drilled a well, about 70% of the cost to drill the well was in the actual drilling of the, uh, the, the hole itself. And the completion costs were about 30%. Today, those numbers are absolutely flipped. 
it costs us about 30% uh, of the dollar, if you want to use one dollar as a, uh, a method of, of explaining this. Um, so the other 70% is completion. It's the pressure pumping. It's all the things that you hear about with respect to how our industry has married the two concepts that, and frankly, have been around for a long time, horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing. And as I'm sure most of you know, hydraulic fracturing's been around since the late 40s. It wasn't exactly a new idea. But it got married uh, within the last 10 years with horizontal drilling. So our ability as an industry then to grow and do things with resources that frankly we'd never been able to before all of a sudden changed. So when it comes to capital allocation, what you've seen this year is, with a few exceptions, you've largely seen the upstream sector, the independent oil and gas community, reduce our budgets anywhere from 30 to 40 plus percent. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that in many cases, particularly with the larger companies like Doug's and mine, we're willing to drill the hole, but we're not willing to complete the hole. And we'll probably wait to use that last 70 cents until we feel like we actually have an economic case in order to invest that last 70 cents to get a rate of return that's acceptable to us. So many of us will continue to increase our inventory of drilled but not completed wells through the course of 2015. And as I'm sure most of you noticed, oil fell off pretty quickly on Friday uh, around a lot of things associated with supply and demand. And uh, I think the concern is starting to mount that as our industry pushes out more and more of these completions, that we're going to push out the recovery in the price of oil as well. From a capital allocation standpoint, uh, I run a company that's around 80 percent U.S. Uh, onshore and in the Gulf of Mexico, and the rest of it's internationally. What this will do is it pushes me to put more and more of my capital to work outside the U.S. That increases the employment of people outside the U.S. We have a very large discovery off uh, the shore of Mozambique where we have found recoverable upwards of 100 TCF of gas. Uh, by the mid-2020s, Mozambique will become probably the third largest exporter of LNG. Uh, there, we get a very different rate of return because of what the world price is for LNG and natural gas than I can by trying to figure out in the next year or two where the price of oil is going to be with respect to our own uh, activities here in the U.S. And for, for a company like ours, and I think Doug too, we kind of break down capital allocation into three things. There's a short-term cycle, kind of like a year, year and a half, where we put the money to work and it comes back. Then there's an intermediate cycle where we invest the money expecting more of a, a two-year to three-year, maybe sometimes four-year horizon before we get it back and get a return on that money. And then there's the long cycle, the stuff that we put into exploration, whether it's deep water or more frontier areas, where we know but from first discovery to first production, we're looking at more than four years before we start creating a cash flow. What that's going to continue to do while there's this uncertainty with short-term or short-cycle investing is that Doug's company and my company and others like us will push off our short cycle investing. We'll reduce our overall capital spend until we see a time where we economically feel like we can invest that last 70 cents onshore in the U.S. to make a good rate of return. Yeah, just to add a couple of thoughts to that. I think, you know, maybe people don't realize this, but, but last year, if we use that as a marker, the oil and gas industry um, in North America invested about 130 percent of its cash flow. So we actually spent more money than we brought in. Um, so you can imagine when the price of our product fell in half, that created a pretty big issue to deal with when you're running a business. So you had to react strongly. And in fact, unfortunately, when looking at Tom's chart, my career has encompassed all four of those shocks. So we've, uh, we've seen this before. And I think one, one difference this time is how quickly we've all responded. And there's, a, there's lots of different views as to why. But we clearly have to make sure our businesses are successful not only today, but tomorrow and into the future. So we all had to pull our capital budgets back dramatically. That's had a direct impact on jobs here in the, in the United States. Uh, since the beginning of December last year, we've already lost 100,000 jobs in the United States in the oil and gas business. That's dramatic. It's not a headline you're seeing on TV. Half of the drilling rigs in, working in the U.S. and Canada are not, that were working in November of last year are not working today. And about two-thirds of the workers in the oil and gas business are blue-collar workers, and they're some of the highest-paying blue-collar jobs in this country. So these are high-quality jobs, and the supply chain goes everywhere. It's interesting, the first layoff announcement I remember seeing 
after November 27th, a lot of us will remember that day, um, was actually in Ohio at a pipe mill, at a, at a plant that manufactures pipe that we use in the industry. So it isn't just about Texas. It's not just about Oklahoma or Alberta or Colorado. It's right across the piece. So we have to respond. The second piece, Tom, I think that's interesting is our industry, it's fascinating because we actually hurt our price all the time because we're trying to get better and better and better at what we do. Um, just in my company, on one of the big plays we're developing in Canada, we cut the cost of development in half in one year. In half in one year. Mm -hmm. In some of the big plays you hear about, like the Bakken and the Eagleford, we're still seeing improvements of 10 to 15% per year in the cost to actually develop a barrel of production or a barrel of reserves. That's innovation, that's technology and know-how. And what's interesting, we can't stop ourselves because I'm not convinced it's necessarily good, but you know, I beat my brains out trying to figure out how to drill wells better than Al does, and he does the same thing with me. And the people who win is the country and the consumer. Uh, they're the people who actually win through that process. Yeah, absolutely, and, and this came up, and just once I, this came up in the last discussion as it, one of the advantages for Mexico where they can actually piggyback on that learning curve that we're still going through. Al? I'll ask just a couple of things, uh, and Doug made a great comment. You know, we compete every day to try to be better than the other guy. But when it comes to safety, when it comes to efficiencies and things that we can figure out how to do better, we actually share that with each other. Uh, the other thing is, is you made, made reference to the jobs. Between 2007 and 2012, the U.S. economy saw about a million jobs of growth. That's all we had. 162,000 of those came from the oil and gas sector. It was up 40%. So most of the job growth during a pretty dismal economic period in the U.S. came from the oil and gas space. And in, as Doug pointed out, we've already seen 100,000 jobs go away. Yeah. Um, absolutely. What we're going to do now, we've got uh, a little bit of time left to, talk, to answer questions. And we won't be able to get to them all, so I encourage you, as I did earlier with the prior panel, to... Uh, You'll see each of these uh, experts in their areas uh, during the breaks and so on. If we don't get to your questions, don't hesitate to, uh, to pose them in, in a less formal setting. I'm going to ask each one. I've distributed some of the questions. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, we got several questions on Keystone. So I've asked Russ and Drew to each uh, pick one. Uh, we won't get to all the issues on that, but uh, we'll, we'll take two of those and then we'll go to uh, one for Doug and, and, and also one for, uh, for uh, Al. And I think that'll probably use up most of the time. I may have a, a, a wrap-up comment or two. So, Russ? All right, I'll, I'll try to, you know, to answer these. This is a, um, there's a question, couple of questions, and I'll try to answer them both with respect to you know, the narrative on Keystone Pipeline moving on to rail. Is it still an economic proposition? Maybe I just sort of start with the beginning. The genesis of, of, the, of the pipeline um, was based on um, uh, a nationalization that took place in Venezuela. Um, you know, the heavy oil that was being supplied from both Mexico, you heard this morning, the Cantorell field in decline. Um, Venezuela expropriating essentially in 2007 um, large U.S. producers, Exxon Mobil, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, basically being kicked out um, and looking for a new source of heavy oil. And those companies similarly making a, a significant investment in uh, the oil sands development in, in Canada. What they're looking for was a conduit between um, Canada and, and those refineries which they had spent, in, you know, in Tom's words, about $85 billion reconfiguring to be able to run heavy crude oil. Seems like a pretty logical thing to do. And the resource itself, uh, you know, from a capital allocation perspective, once you put the capital dollars in, production costs are actually fairly low. Um, and you don't have to re-drill on, on an annual basis. So that investment has already been made. And those reserves will actually operate now for the next 30, 40, 50 years. And those refineries are reconfigured to run for the next 30, 40, 50 years. They just need a hard-wired piece of pipe in between. That's the genesis of the pipe. So the question on, uh, you know, will this be an economic proposition two years from now? It will be an economic proposition 20 years from now. And these co companies have signed 20 and 25-year contracts with our company, and the reason that they didn't sign 40-year contracts is because we didn't offer them 40-year contracts. But that, that, that oil movement will continue to occur for, for a long period of time. And the, the question of, of you know, that, that where the environmental groups have, have said, well, if uh, the price of oil falls, um, uh, um, will this oil not just, just stay in the ground? And the answer is, well, no, it won't. It'll just move by another, another form of transportation. It, it's now moving 
you know, that, that production is on stream. A million barrels a day has, have come on stream. Um, it's now actually flowing to, to the marketplace. It's being loaded in rail cars. And that's actually the real tragedy in, in all of this is, is we're now in a situation where, you know, by holding up the infrastructure, that sort of macro environment created this, this massive investment opportunity at both ends of the, of the pipe, that, that the, the refinery end and at the production end. Billions of dollars have been spent, and we have $8 billion to spend in the middle to connect it together. That's not happening. So do you think that oil is going to, that oil is now going to stay in the ground as a result of not building that pipeline? And that is the craziest thing I've ever heard. Um, it's flowing. It's just being put in rail cars today. Um, and yeah, it's a couple bucks more expensive. Um, but you're not going to stop that commerce of you know, $85 billion being spent at this end and literally hundreds of billions of dollars being spent at this end. It's already spent. And, and the $8 billion in the middle um, isn't the biggest piece of the economic pie um, by which you determine whether production will come on and come off. So we really have to get beyond this, the, the, this, this um, you know, political rhetoric around um, maybe the oil will just stay in the ground if we don't build infrastructure. That that's, just doesn't make any sense. Doug? Yeah, the question here was... Well, I'm sorry. I was going to, I was going to Drew next. Okay. Yep. Um, well, I have a question here that actually I think flows from the one you got, which is uh, basically why don't you keep the oil in Canada, in, uh, in Alberta particularly? Why don't you upgrade it, refine it? In, in country as opposed to sending it somewhere else to add value. It's a common political discussion in Canada. And I think the answer is implicit in what Russ just said. You've got a, uh, a huge investment already made where capacity is there to take on Canadian heavy, heavy oil. And to build that equivalent capacity in Canada just wouldn't be economically viable to the same extent it is to send it south. And so I think that's, uh, that's the short answer. I have another question, which I think is probably one we can tag team. It's the discussing the advantage of Keystone Pipeline for the US. And I know there's a few off the top of my head that uh, we use routinely about it uh, displacing less secure sources of oil from Venezuela and the Middle East. There's the job impacts that it would have in the US. And maybe I'll let Russ speak to those a little bit. Um, there are the, um, the climate change benefits of a pipeline versus using other uh, forms of transportation, pipeline, uh, sorry, climate change and safety implications of using pipelines over rail. And Russ, I'm, maybe I should just hand over to you because you probably answer this question on a routine basis. Yeah, I guess I'll, I could just sort of finish with, you know, the Department of State final environmental impact statement addresses all of these issues. Um, and at, you know, the, 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 the most important one is, is the safety one. Um, what the Department of State concludes is, if um, we don't build this pipeline, we will put the oil on rail. It actually concludes that. Um, and it will go to U.S. You know, refineries, so there's no question that it's coming from you know, US, Canadian U.S. producers, but also picks up Bach and crude, moves it to, to the marketplace. Um, it outlines, um, uh, if you don't build the pipeline, we will have, I believe it says, 49 more accidents on an annual basis and six more deaths on an annual basis. And that statistically just, just will occur it actually uh, details that the greenhouse gas emissions will actually rise um, by putting it in a locomotive that runs on, on, on bunker fuel oil um, as opposed to a, a pipeline that, that pumps the oil with electric motors. Um, and then the energy security one is really the, you know, the primary one where this started from is, is U.S. companies got expropriated in Venezuela and it appears to me that you know, the, the, the best place to get that oil is probably someplace on the continent both from American and Canadian and producers. And, that's what the theme of what we've been talking about is, is that is the benefit, is, is we'd rather get it here than get it elsewhere in the world. You, 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 you dictate your own destiny if you, if you do that. Doug? Yes, yeah, so we're, we're down to the last few minutes, so just... So I'll try to be quick. Yeah, it's about kind of what happens if we hit storage capacity. What will that mean for price? And, and the reality is, is the market has to balance. So um, uh, la on Friday, the price of oil fell fairly dramatically. Um, a lot of people predict over the next few weeks we may actually see domestic price start with a three. Um, the global price will probably still start with a five or a, I mean, with a five or a six, which talks about this issue that we face with the export ban. Uh, just remember, though, the world consumes today somewhere about 92, 93 million barrels a day. Um, and it, it will get fed from someplace. That, that market will be met. It's critical that it's met. And the supply and the price will balance. Most people don't believe 50 is sustainable, that you can't replace 93 million barrels a day at 50. 
But part of the problem which led to the dramatic drop was $100 probably wasn't required either. And you see the market rebalancing, and it's messy right now. And this is where government policy can have a direct impact that has economic implications. So an outdated policy is actually preventing the markets from working efficiently. Thank you. And the question that was posed is, what's the timing of viable legislation <coughs> reversing the ban on crude oil exports? I think the good news is, is that I think we have an understanding, uh, at least I feel like, and I think Doug does too, I, I believe we have an understanding of the issue amongst uh, those in the Senate and the House and in, in the executive branch. Where we go and how we get there is still a little bit to be determined. We have a fairly compressed calendar uh, because of things that have gone on already with the way in which uh, legislation has come into uh, the Hill. Uh, not the least of which we spent, we basically lost the month of February around Homeland Security. We're getting ready to take up the budget. I don't think either of us feel like this will be a standalone bill. If it has success in 2016, it'll more likely be an amendment to another bill. And uh, we hope and believe we're going to continue to put resources behind trying to get something done in 2016. I mean, if not 2015. Great, thank you. I have one other question here, and I'm going to use it as a wrap up. Uh, the public has grave misunderstandings about the basic energy issues, whether hydraulic fracturing or, or standard infrastructure like Keystone. How can industry better communicate its message to the public? And, and you know, this is a, a real issue. We talked about it a little bit earlier this morning, and uh, Doug's talked about it, Al's talked about it. Uh, all, throughout industry, there's a real sense of uh, ne needing a more effective forum. This conference, in my experience, and this is the fourth session now, uh, is one of the leaders in that respect. We have students here. We have an outreach program that, that provides, uh, looks to provide uh, a variety of viewpoints, not, not closing off any of them, uh, and that's what distinguishes it. I, I attend lots and lots of conferences each year uh, within the industry, and they're, they're important conferences, but but the industry talking to itself is, is not the way that we can overcome uh, a long-standing uh, set of perceptions that frankly are, are changing rather dramatically in a world where there are geopolitical forces at work, that the, that the, uh, the broader societies that we're dealing with are well aware of, and energy is integral to how we deal with that. So I, I hope you, uh, through the course of the balance of this conference will carry away that whether you're students, whether you're coming from academia, whether you're coming from industry, or just citizens who care about uh, the, the national interests of uh, each of these countries in North America. Uh, when I wrote my book, I, I talked about uh, a, the emergence of power triangles, and I talked about it the last couple of uh, talks I gave in, in prior sessions. Uh, power triangles involving the commonality of energy interests uh, it, between Moscow, Beijing, and Tehran, and to a degree, in an emerging way, between add one other locus to that, uh, New Delhi. And, and it's reshaping uh, the forces that are at work and the motivations that are at work in the Eastern Hemisphere. Uh, I'm not trying to suggest we want to be just North America by any means. In fact, what we're talking about, and this conference's theme speaks to, is the, the emerging role, uh, leadership role, of a unified and, and very complementary set of policies for Mexico, the U.S., and Canada uh, as, as we see the reshaping of geopolitical forces in the world. And communicating that more broadly to our populace is absolutely critical. Duncan talked about how important it is when you have a democracy embrace change. And that's what we're talking about here for North America. So thank you very much. We'll move on. I think we're running a little, uh, a few minutes behind, but uh, we'll look to make up some, some of that. Thank you. Thanks.